Welcome back to the historic McDowell Phillips House Restoration Preservation Project. It's really exciting to see the changes start to take place in the front of the house and see the color placement coming back to life and bringing out the details of the architecture. What's kind of interesting is there are actually six different colors of paint going on the front facade. Um, certainly the red is a nice deep, deep color pulling that detail out and then the different greens to highlight certain aspects. Brian, tell us a little bit about something kind of unique that you're doing on what we're calling that lighthouse window up in, up in the attic. How are they painting that? Right, that's a window with 110 small panes of glass, each 4 by 5 inches. And there's a solution you can buy that you paint this film around the inside edge of the, the frames. Yeah. And you can then put your paint on, and then when all is dry, it scrapes off very simple, like pulling off uh, glue from your skin, okay. if you will. And uh, it saves a great deal of labor time on the painter's part as well it makes for some nice clean edges and it's very easy to use in fact we've used it on the inside windows as well yeah uh, because of the intricate detail of painting and all that and even with a steady hand any good painter will still get some on the glass but this prevents that problem from happening and it's really been a neat product i wasn't aware of until uh uh, the painters pointed it out sure. to me, and it's available at the, the Sherwin-Williams store, any paint store, I'm sure. Well, it's probably going to save a lot of time and make it easier. I know taking a razor blade and scraping a, a nice edge is not easy. No. And certainly isn't. that window is not the most accessible <laughs> thing on the front of the house. It's a very difficult piece and very challenging, as is most of the front of the house, probably has the most challenging painting aspects sure. of the home. Yeah. Uh, the corbels, you'll see the, the uh, ceiling underneath the, the overhang is a different color. Mm -hmm. uh, the bay window was very complicated to paint. Obviously the stained glass window was extremely important to paint right, and to get, get a good job that. there because that's a major feature of the house. Yeah. Why don't we take a walk around the north side and kind of see what they're working on and see where they're painting. Sure. So here we are on the north side of the house, which was the second most important facade of the McDowell Phillips mansion. You can see the painters from Serta Pro are just doing an amazing job picking out the detail and all the trim work on this house. What's interesting is noticing all the details that are so indicative of that shingle style with obviously the shingles and the curves around the corners, the simple columns, kind of that fluted half circle uh, lunette on the third floor in the attic that beautiful oval window at the back of the house and all the different panels on the windows themselves. What's also kind of cool is the leaded windows that are in the dining room are really starting to show up now that the house is a little bit lighter and the window frames are darker. And that's something that Victorian era homes and designers did a lot, that they played with shadow and light with the paint. So it's going to be exciting to see how this turns out. The uh, paint by Sherwin-Williams doing a wonderful job at bringing back some color and life to this beautiful home. So today we're back in the front office or den. We're not honestly quite sure what this room was when it was built. Um, but our friend Farrell is back doing some woodwork uh, restoration and stripping down. So over time, things age as we all do. And the woodwork on this fireplace mantel had gotten really dark, as you can see there. But Farrell, if you could open that door, let's show what, what the original finish actually looked like. So this is an example of a restoration where Farrell is taking off of the finish and the age and getting it back to how it would have, would have looked in 1890. Farrell, what's the process that you're doing to strip this back? Well, we're taking um, alcohol, uh, good old moonshine alcohol. Uh, it's called denatured alcohol and that will soften up the uh, natural shellac that's on the finish from 1890. Okay. And then with steel wool, you just rub it off. It doesn't adhere into the wood grain like an oil paint would, so it just oh, comes nice. off very, very nicely. Yeah. And again, we're going to use shellac again, the original uh, organic shellac, to bring mm -hmm. the finish back. I'll put a stain on it, a, a little bit of a finishing oil, and then uh, the shellac over that. Okay. But because there was so much, we call it alligatoring when the uh, shellac fails, that it all cringes like that. Yeah. And the one thing you'll hear on a lot of TV shows is about uh, saving the patina. Well, there's a fine line between patina and just grunge and dirt. And <laughs> we had crossed that into grunge and dirt. Yeah. So we really had to bring it back to uh, what it was. And <laughs> we're going to bring it back into exactly the way it was in the 1890s. Well, what's kind of cool, as we were just talking, you're taking all the darkness off, and these little details are starting to show up, some of the little carvings, and this really cool little corbel here. Um, 
with little feathers on it. So this is, a, this is exciting. It's getting it back. Going to polish up the hinges as well. No, we're going to leave those natural. They're actually steel. Feral. If you're restoring, we got to restore. Well, you know, that's the way probably they looked. And the only thing I could possibly do is, like, take them off and really shine them. But again, they would have oxidized into that within a year of being on there. Okay. And again, the 1870s is when steel came in as a household product for hinges and yeah. clasps and everything else like that. And it shows. Now, again, true arts and crafts it would have been copper or bronze, you know, hand hammered or something like that. Sure. But again, I like the idea of, well, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, this brand new product came on the market called steel. It became yep. available to households thanks to uh, Mr. Carnegie over there in Pittsburgh. Yeah. It was so. kind of cool. I don't know if people watching the show know what these are. These are gas light fixtures. So when the house was built, it would have had gas lights. So there's, you know, the gas comes out there, there would have been a globe on here, and that would have been the light. It was not common to have central ceiling fixtures in homes of this era. So sconces and things like that were how they would light a, light a house at nighttime. And it has the little cock underneath it there that you can turn the gas on and off. And you can swing it out to avoid heat getting yeah. right against the back of the fireplace. So kind of a nice original feature. I'm glad they left on that. That's really cool. And we have the original globes, too. Oh, wow, OK. So well, Farrell, we look forward to seeing your uh, final product here and see how you bring this thing back. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Here we are in the original master bedroom for RM and Elizabeth McDowell. And again, we talk about this house and the history that's been preserved and maintained. And one of the cool things is the bed is original to this house. This, this is a family heirloom that has stayed with the house throughout this time. And Brian and I were talking, it's, it's kind of fun to see how the outside architecture is articulated on the inside. So we have this beautiful bay window that, that is part of that turret that rises up the corner and really shows kind of that whole shingle influence design coming in. And Brian, tell me a little bit about this fireplace. Well, this is, again, one of seven fireplaces. It has a different tile structure and, and a whole different carve, which I believe would be... Uh, Looks, I believe we thought this was either mahogany, or perhaps cherry. Yeah. And uh, we'll be looking at uh, how good the finish cleans up. We may just leave it the way it is. Uh, there's a lot, again, in this house with seven different fireplaces, sure. none of them are the same. So it kind of makes it an interesting uh, talking point. Obviously, being gas heated originally in the house, this would have been a source of heat for the bedroom. Yeah. Uh, until uh, the hot water system was installed. So, again, another very practical uh purpose and it's a beautifully carved and ornate piece in the living room yeah or, it really in is. the bedroom rather that goes with this bedroom set it'll be nice to see how this evolves what looking forward when this is the museum is the intention to use these second floor rooms for exhibition or is it going to be set up more like a house museum well in this particular room it will probably be focused on a bedroom okay. uh, as as we may have other elements we have several other pieces at the in our museum collection that would look beautiful in here including a gorgeous wicker uh covered baby cradle okay that looks like it would go right with this set nice and that was a local uh donation uh, that we're real happy to get and we said we know the perfect spot for it when we obtain this house. So we're going to have a very uh, nice floor covering. We're going to be stripping the wallpaper mm -hmm. and the paint on it. Uh, the plasters a few weeks ago already corrected the one uh, plaster crack that was fairly significant, but they did a great job repairing it. So once we get the paper off, we'll assess the walls and see if uh, uh, any other repairs are necessary. And then we'll pick out a nice paper for this room. But this will be a focal point of the home sure, tours. Absolutely. I, I think the bed alone is quite unique and of course it has a matching dresser right here yeah. uh, with a marble top and it, it's a very uh, very beautiful piece I think and uh, of course the colors will really pop once we have the bedding and the choice of fabrics probably right. a set tea perhaps in front of those beautiful bay windows. Uh, interesting this is, and the other bedroom <coughs> adjoining it are the only two rooms in the house that have pine floors and we're thinking Due to the fire in 1903, there was a great deal of reconstruction on the house. Most likely this floor was damaged by water uh, fighting the fire since it was directly above our heads in the attic. Mm -hmm. And my guess is that the, the flooring was replaced at that time. That could be. Well, cool. We look forward to seeing how this room evolves and, and what takes place. Welcome back to the McDowell Phillips House Project. We're here on the rear of the house. And uh, Brian, tell us a little bit about what's been happening on the house 
in the past week? Well, the past few weeks we've got uh, some breaks in the weather finally, although it's been very warm. The painters have really been able to get the bulk of the house finished. The shingles, which about 80% of the shingles on the house, as you recall, were gray because those were brand new wood uh, cedar shingles that yeah. were pre-primed gray. That made the paint go on much smoother and easier. And so they're really able to make up some time they lost due to the weather delays. The lower part, they've started on the horizontal siding. And a lot of the more of the intricate work now remains. That's trimming these windows, which again, each one of those upper windows has 32 panes of glass. So painstakingly painted and, right. and caulked or glazed uh, if the glass needed it. So the painter's been very busy this week. You'll notice under the underhang, the straw color is also done now. And next we'll be doing the columns, the porch railings, and really wrapping up the trim on this side of the house. What's really cool is now that the colors are going on in the placement, you can see the detail and that subtlety that we talked about before with the, the little brick wreck on the bottom and just the angles and, and the bows. It's looking good. It's getting close to done. We hope about another week and then Fantastic. they'll be ready to be done. Well, let's go check out your barn. I know this has been one of your passions, getting this ready for the carriage. Let's go see how it turned out. Sure. So Brian, your pet project here, this wonderful barn that's going to house the sleigh and the carriage, it's looking pretty good. Tell me about what y'all did out here. Well, the, the carpenter team led by Tom Cavalier and Brian and Alan Koth really did a wonderful job in this barn. As you might have seen from the earlier pictures, uh, it lacked doors of any kind when we purchased the property. They'd been missing for many, many years. So we really didn't have a template to go on, but right. we did come up with a design we felt would look more like a carriage house look on this type of structure. Yeah. So they totally rebuilt the front end. They added these beautiful swing out doors, which are so perfectly plumb and balanced, you can literally open it with your pinky. Nice. And so it's gonna be very nice to bring the sleigh and the carriage. And we also have Blake McDowell's, I believe it's a Velocipede, the real big wheel oh, bicycle. Cool. Okay. Uh, nice. That's in the John Smart house. We felt what a great place to have that bicycle yeah. on display. It'll be right here. So we also have some other cool items we think are gonna really be nice uh, to display along with those vehicles. And uh, it's just real exciting, a tremendous amount of work. But, you know, a year ago, we probably would have considered bulldozing this barn until we looked closely at the structure, yeah. realized that the bones actually were pretty good shape. And it'd be a shame not to keep an original building if we could. So well, fantastic. it really turned out well. New floor, the walls have been <clears throat> sealed up, the, uh, all the friendly critters are gone. So uh, it's really gonna be a nice, secure, dry storage for our two of our most important artifacts uh, in our collection. Fantastic, the team did a great job. Yeah, it looks wonderful. And yeah. uh, the volunteers really helped paint both the inside walls as well as the exterior. And it's just gonna be a, a phenomenal show, pay, show piece uh, when it's all through. Cool, well I understand there's been some wallpaper going up inside, so let's go take a sneak at how that's progressing. Well, we're back in the dining room. There's quite a bit of transformation taking place. You're seeing some wallpaper going up on the top. Brian, tell me a little bit about the process of choosing this particular wallpaper for the room. <laughs> How many editions we went through? <laughs> Actually, uh, we do have a committee that helps guide the selection of paper. We want to go something in the very historic realm of an 1890s Victorian. Uh, this particular paper collection uh, was found by our uh, volunteer, Paul Wood, who's in the paper business and understands how these collections are assembled, right down to the technique of how the design actually went on the paper, yeah. which is not your standard wallpaper. Uh, it's not inexpensive paper, but it's not outrageous either, but it's a high quality, very similar design and application you would have found in Victorian wallpaper. So the committee work looks real hard at what the room is gonna be used for, what type of paper, would withstand wear right. and, and cleaning and things like that that we have to consider in a museum. So there's a lower paper that mates with this paper. Uh, that's not here yet, it's, it's on order. And it will be a very nice once this room is complete. And then we'll use the table setting and the grand table setup uh, to really highlight the colors of the room. And right. this room will be really something that, special. It's usually the first room people see upon entering the house sure. once they get past the foyer. So we're really wanting this room to be a showstopper. And I think it will be. What I like about this, it's a bit controversial for people, but again, the shingle style is, you know, between the Victorian yes. over the top gilded everything and more of the arts and crafts. And this strikes that balance of nature, but it still has a cool pattern. What I personally love, and I know there's some controversy, mm -hmm. I actually love how the blue tile 
actually ties into the wallpaper and kind of this turquoise blue in here. It, for me, it pulls it up together, but we'll see it when it's all done. Yeah, I think when it's done, it's going to be very nice. And I don't know if we've mentioned it, salve is Latin for welcoming. So we want the room to be very welcoming, sure. whether it's for a dinner, for a, hosting an event, or just a house tour. We really want this room to be a very welcoming room, not stiff and too yeah. formal, but not too relaxed either. So it's Fantastic. Well, let's continue the wallpaper tour in the den. We can check out Farrell's uh, finished product on mm -hmm. that fireplace mantle and see how that turned out. Okay. Well, Brian, this fireplace mantle turned out beautiful. Farrell did an awesome job. I have to admit, I was, uh, I was a little panicked when I saw him taking off that aged finish, but boy, did it bring out the details. Yeah, the quarter sawn oak, which he's very proud to point out the detail, the, the right. dental work here. The, uh, the cupboards originally had an oak finish just like this with shellac, but they had been closed for years, obviously, and not a lot of daylight got to them. Right. So what he did is really restore this beautiful oak mantle back to its original beauty. And I don't know how many hours I lost track, but I would guess a good 30 hours he probably devoted to cleaning, re numerous coats, yeah. uh, and it turned out beautiful. And it's complementing the woodwork in here very nicely as well. Yeah, it really does. It works well. And then, so the wallpaper in here, um, this is very similar to a piece that you found in the house, correct? Correct. Up towards the attic wall and attic, when we were scraping and doing some other work, we discovered original paper had a very similar pattern. And again, Paul Wood and his expertise in historic wallpaper yeah. found a very similar pattern. And this has been very common in Victorian era more or less like a nature scene. Right, right. Uh, it gives you a very relaxed feeling looking at mountains and rivers. I could see this from being a very peaceful resting den, which is probably what it was used for. And uh, it's turning into being one of my favorite rooms of the house. I, I could see a good book and a bourbon in here in a minute. Especially the bourbon. I Absolutely. Feel good. Fantastic. Well, why don't we go upstairs? I know that uh, curator Joanne King is here doing some of the archival research that we've been talking about. So let's go up there and see what she's actually working on and see how that process takes place. Sure. That's the real meat and potatoes of museum work. Fantastic. Let's go. Well, today we're back in the workroom at the McDowell Phillips house. And this is an exciting day. We have C uh, curator emeritus Joanne King and Tom Hilberg here with us today. So as, as we've been talking about this project, it's fascinating the amount of stuff and the documentation that the family has left here literally for 120, 130 years. So part of what Joanne and Tom do is go through all the boxes and everything that they find and document it and determine what do we keep, what do we not keep, what's important, what's not. Now, Joanne, you have a few things laid out here. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about what this is, where you found it, and, and what's okay. the relevance. Uh, this is an invitation to Lincoln's inaugural ball in 1860. And it's made out to who? It, uh, H.G. Blake. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we actually, you can see the condition. We found this in the bottom of a drawer in a chest in the barn. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's fantastic. And so the mice kind of had their way with it. So H. G. Blake. But this was a surprise. He was he he was in the Civil War. Was he a general? No, no, he was, he a, was a colonel. Okay, he was a colonel. So he yeah. would have been invited, or he was invited to Lincoln's inaugural, eighteen sixty one. That's incredible, yes. in yes. D.C. Okay. But at this date, he was a U.S. representative. Okay, and there were yeah. there's a story that. Um, didn't his daughter Elizabeth go to Washington with him pretty regularly? Yes. Okay, so there's a really yes. cool family tie there. Yes, and then, absolutely. And then what else do we have here? Uh, we have a second uh, presidential invitation to Mrs. R. McDowell. Okay. In 1897. 97. From William McKinley. McKinley. So this, this was dad. <laughs> This was Dad's invitation, and this was his daughter Elizabeth. What What are some of the he, things? Yeah, I was just going to add that uh, it was addressed to Mrs. R. M. McDowell. Okay. Because Mr. R. M. McDowell had passed away. Oh, by that so time. Okay. It's unusual for a woman, I think, to get an invitation like yeah. this. It shows you the close relationship between McKinley. And the McDowell family. Yeah, they so that's 97, friends. so that was mailed to this house, yes? Correct. Okay, very cool. Correct. What are some of the surprises that, that you've 
found so far? Oh. <laughs> are some of the cool things that you found so far? Well, those, of course. Are, I mean, this is pretty are, cool. Are cool. Yes, they're very cool. Um, you know, it's it's just like Christmas. Yeah. Every day. <laughs> so I'm talking about with Brian. Um, I just opened up a bag today, just a little grocery bag. Yeah. Full of canceled checks. Okay. Canceled okay. checks, big deal. But that really tells you about the businesses in town. Yeah. Um, it, it tells you a great deal more than the fact Absolutely. that it's just a check. So what's, what, what's your vision for all of this stuff? When this, this is going to be display museum, but also house museum, somewhat public space. Yes. What's your vision for how this will be interpreted and shared with the public? Uh, some will be displayed. Okay. But we'll also have a research center. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. So people can come read family letters. Mm -hmm. They can come and uh, do research in local history. Okay. Uh, it's We also will have the H.G. Blake collection. Oh, cool. Nice. Which is vast. Yeah. And uh, so it's... That will be a big part of the house, actually, is that resource center. Be because there is so much stuff, honestly, do you think you'll ever get through it all? Me personally? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eventually. I mean, there's, there's just an extraordinary yes, amount of documentation. Yes, we have four documentation. people working on it now. Yeah. Tom is obviously one of them. Um, but it's, it's daunting. Sure, I bet. Because we go to the attic and look, and you see a trunk, and you're not sure what's in that trunk. <laughs> right, right. And we were in the attic on our last what? visit, I think, and, and just, again, the piles of stuff. It's oh. like Christmas morning. You want to keep opening. Yes. You know? And it's like an archaeological dig. Well, that's fantastic. We're excited to keep following the story, and hopefully we'll come back and visit you and see what else you found uh, in the coming weeks. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Thank you. So we're back up here in the master bedroom on the second floor, which is, is the turret room essentially on the second floor. And what's kind of fun about deconstructing a house before you start to restore it is you take away elements and uncover things. So the crews, Brian and the committee has been very, very active taking down the wallpaper. And you can start to see some of the changes and some of the things that are underneath. Brian, tell us a little bit about this fun little note that you found on the wall. Well, it was kind of interesting as we were scraping the paper off the wall, it was coming off pretty tough, but we saw some pencil lines and I go, that's not a, a, a straight line for paper. Yeah. We started scraping carefully. We found out it was actually signed by a man who identified himself as the Pace Boy, but his <laughs> name was Thomas Clark and he lived at 17 Grove Street in Cleveland, Ohio. And he also dated it, which was really cool. April 21st, 1892, which tells us that by the time they papered this room, the house took about two years to build. Yeah. So this would have been one of the final uh, pieces of uh, finished work that would have gone on in the house. Yeah, and it's a pretty elaborate signature there. Yeah, he, he, uh, he did a very beautiful handwriting, <laughs> and he drew a swan, and then further over, he drew like another turkey. So chances are he had a little time on his hands when the boss wasn't looking, and Maybe the, the glue wasn't ready or the paste wasn't quite ready, so he took this opportunity to put a little memorial here. And this yeah. is a great find. Not only that, it helps date that the plaster is the original on the wall. That's and, true. And uh, that helps us determine was there additional damage from the fire, and it doesn't appear like it, it hit this part of the, of the room. Yeah. So the plan for this room is to repaper, yes. correct? Cover this back up. Surprisingly, the plaster is in pretty good condition. Yes, there was one repair we did earlier this year uh, to crack the, the most significant crack. But overall, for its age, not bad condition. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll certainly cover some of the divots, uh, the marks as best we can. And uh, again, a nice quality, uh, historically accurate paper. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, as a sidebar, one of our donors, a woman from Florida who actually lived in this room, was so excited when she saw this on the wall. She goes, my goodness, that was my bedroom that was there. So <laughs> she was really excited when we posted this photo That's cool. of this. And uh, we tried to research this address in Cleveland because up till 1905, streets had names. And then when the city of Cleveland right, renumbered everything, yeah. 
So we took to the Sanborn fire maps, which were a very handy tool to research properties. Uh, and we found this address uh, and it was very close to the inner urban line. So okay. within one alleyway away, this worker could have hopped on the inner urban, probably been to Medina in, in a pretty short time. So was he an east sider or a west sider? It's more east side, it's like east 32nd, really? more or less right now. Uh, some of the streets were realigned, some alleys were yeah. closed, uh, but it's basically underneath I-77. Okay. <laughs> so unfortunately cool. the house didn't stand, but it was a working class neighborhood and uh, very common in that area to have a house and this property looks like it had a small barn. Mm -hmm. So maybe they had a cow or some chickens, yeah. uh, which again was very common in this time period. So again, another clue to the history of the house that we didn't know about. Right, right. So now we're just putting all this together as a diary of the house so that future generations will learn. And we're probably gonna frame this in uh, around the wallpaper. Keep it uncovered. So we can keep it uncovered. It's a great docent talking point. Uh, we have this gorgeous bedroom set that was original to the McDowell family, mm -hmm. uh, but this is something kind of cool to talk yeah. about as well. And then another change that happened in the room, you were telling me the um, closet door was shifted to align with the room, probably when it was turned into an apartment, correct? Correct, yes. We could see the, the shadow marks of the plaster repair. Actually, uh, Drew Phillips' grandfather, when he converted the house to four apartments, uh, one on each end of the house and the first and second floor, yeah. He was very creative and he probably had the blueprints here, which certainly helped in those kind of decisions. If he shifted that closet door three feet to the left, it aligned up with the closet door on the other side of the room. So that was the cut through for the apartment. This would yes. have been the living room. Uh, the next room over would have been a bedroom. Yeah. And the room behind us here is the kitchen uh, dining. So it actually wasn't a horrible uh, move to make to convert the house to apartments. It could be changed back, but we'll probably leave it be for now because it does help the house flow right. uh, as the museum tours will uh, help us explain why that happened that way. So it was a hit. Miriam Phillips shared with me that Drew always said his grandfather would hope somebody in the family someday would return the house to a single family. And that's what Drew and Miriam had done. Right. And so it's kind of neat that uh, whatever his grandfather had done, it could be undone for the most part. True. So, Very cool. Yeah. Well, join us next time when we hopefully the outside of the house will be finished or largely finished. We're going to meet with Tom Hilberg, one of the other curators, going through the papers and uh, uncover some more mysteries of this house. We'll see you next week. <laughs>